Welcome, readers. Today on Book Chat, joining me are my three book bloggers, one series read-along co-host, Casey and Nicola. We are discussing the first book in our fall trilogy read-along, Burn For Me by Ilona Andrews. Stay tuned. Today's episode is brought to you by the Shelf Addiction Merch Store. Check out all the bookish t-shirts, notebooks, mugs, and more. Don't miss out on these original designs, perfect for any book nerd. Support the podcast and visit shelfaddiction.com forward slash merch and pick up your next favorite bookish item. Hey everyone, I am your host Tamara Ford and welcome to Book Chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. Join in the book discussion by finding me on Twitter as well as my co-host. Tweet at us using our special hashtag 3bloggers1series. That's using the numeric 3 and 1. Again, that's hashtag 3bloggers1series. If Twitter isn't your thing, no worries. You can join the Facebook group Shelf Addiction Official and talk about the series with us there as well as other bookish topics. I hope to hear your thoughts on this book discussion. The links for every Everything I've mentioned are below in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode, please support the podcast by sharing it with one book nerd friend or on your favorite social media space. That will really help me out and I appreciate you. Before we get started, I have to issue a spoiler warning. This is a roundtable book discussion, so nothing is off limits. You've been warned. We've got a fun hour ahead of us, so let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back. Today kicks off the first in the fall trilogy read-along discussion. I'm your host, Tamara, and as always, joining me are the three bloggers, one series read-along co-host, Casey and Nicola. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Hey. So before we dive into Burn For Me, I want to be sure to welcome everyone that's listening on the various podcast platforms, as well as our read-along buddies listening to this early inside the Shelf Addiction Facebook group. If you want to get in on this conversation, as well as chatting live with other readers, be sure to find us on Facebook right away. Find us right now. Stop what you're doing and go to Facebook. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started. And first, Casey, would you mind running down the book and audiobook stats? Hey, so we're reading Burn For Me, the first book in the Hidden Legacy series by Alona Andrews. The stats are 382 pages in the mass market book or 406 pages on the ebook. And it's narrated by Renee Rodman. And it's 12 hours and 46 minutes long, unabridged. That went by real fast, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know there's some of you guys that finished the book weeks ago, or you haven't even started yet. And for you, we do have a synopsis. So, Nicola, would you mind giving us the synopsis? Sure thing. This is from the back of the book. So it's a, the publisher blurb says, uh, one woman must place her trust in a seductive, dangerous man who sets off an even more dangerous desire. Nevada Baylor is faced with the most challenging case of her detective career, a suicide mission to bring in a suspect in a volatile situation. Nevada isn't sure she has the chops. Her quarry is a prime, the highest rank of magic user who can set anyone and anything on fire. Then she's kidnapped by Connor Mac, Mad Rogan, a darkly tempting billionaire with equally devastating powers. Torn between wanting to run and wanting to surrender to their overwhelming attraction, Nevada must join forces with Rogan to stay alive. Rogan is after the same target, so he needs Nevada. But she's getting under his skin, making him care about someone other than himself for a change. And as Rogan has learned, love can be as perilous as death, especially in the magic world. Very good synopsis, I think. I yeah, think it's good. I think so. It's, oh, yeah. it's a brand new series. It's a whole new magical world, and uh, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, it is good. <laughs> and full disclosure, I think if you guys are in the group, you know we've all kind of admitted that we've already read it. So this is re uh, rereads for all of us. Yep. Yep. So we already know we like it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had some issues with that with some of our other <laughs> series. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And for me, I decided to change it up and do the audiobook this time because I read it last time. So I kind of wanted a different flavor to see if, if it changed anything for me. So that's why I chose a different way to consume it this time around. Cool. Yeah. Did it? It did. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it did. And, and not in the best way, but we'll talk about that uh, as we, you know, when I 
get my chance to talk about the narrator, but I love the story. Same as I did before. I really love Nevada. She's like one of my favorite women heroines that, you know, know how to check their men and don't Mm -hmm. let them run them over. I love that. I love that in a strong female. I can't help it. It's like my favorite thing. Yeah. They love her because she's the only one that stands up to them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly that's why i'm like you know the alpha guys they love it when you talk smack to them they love it when you (laughs) knock down a couple pegs they love it (laughs) not always at first though (laughs) Mm -hmm. oh never at first but if you can back it up if you can say no and smack them down then yeah they love it yeah so what did you guys think did you love it as much second time around as you did first time around Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, Totally. Yeah. I think, I think something about knowing how it ends in the trilogy makes the reread, um, makes certain details pop out more. So Mm -hmm. I I don't know if we should like talk about those kind of details. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. What what really hit me this time around was the the prologue with Kelly Waller. She turns out to be like, like can, we're going to spoil. I'm going to start off spoiling really bad right now. She turns out to be like a really bad guy, like really bad all the way through it. So this initial scene where she's going in to ask for help, it sounds like when you when you read it the first time, it's very superficial. She's in a rough spot. Her son's in trouble, and she needs help. But it turns mm-hmm. out this is all like there's a ruse yeah there's there's yeah. there's a hidden agenda everywhere and everything she says has two meanings and it's just like wow <laughs> so. there was one line where she's like oh my god i wonder if he can read my mind and the first time i read that you think you know she's just scared because yeah. he's mad Roman and he's terrifying but now you're like oh god it would be bad for her your mind, <laughs> everything would be fucked yeah mm-hmm yeah mm-hmm and she and there's the, the little um, italic internal monologue when she's talking to him. She's like, establish a common ground. Remind him who you are. And then she says, where's the mm-hmm. switch? She asks. It had been the favorite hangout of the Rogan kids. So she's very calculating yeah. in the way she approaches him. And partly because she's terrified because with good, yeah. with good reason. And that's what you think when you read it the first time. And the second time, or in my case, the third time through, it's like, <laughs> oh... Mm-hmm. She's really, and I, and I still don't know if her husband knew what she was up to. Yeah, I don't know, but I do agree with you because the first time through, I just thought, wow, you know, she's thinking ahead because she knows mm-hmm. she's going to have to convince him. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And even at first, even on the second time at first, I'm like, well, yeah, he never really, you know, those things came up before where he never helped his family right. that was, you know, outcast. So, yeah, she really had to throw everything up, you know, up against the wall and try to get him to help. But then I'm like, oh, no, she's so sleazy. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, 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 no. In the epilogue, he says that he offered the uh, Gavin his cousin yeah. nephew he offered gavin fund. like a college fund yeah but she turned him down and yeah. he always thought it was pride but now he knows it's hatred right mm-hmm. and right. there was something mm-hmm. else where you know from his point of view where he's like oh i did this thing but now she really hates me or there's something else in the epilogue yeah yeah and it, so- it sounds like thomas didn't really know what was going on it sounds like yeah like he was kind he of on had to be sedated and yeah it was awful Oh, poor guy. Yeah. I mean, like, it's cutthroat. Like, this book, all these different houses and how they go about, you know, reaching, I guess, the highest level of power and holding on to it, the plotting, even like with genetics. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all cutthroat. It's like do or die up in here. So (laughs) if people stab you in the back, you shouldn't be surprised, I guess. Yeah. What, no, nope. this is this is Alona Andrews. That their t- the team. It's their fourth world that they've built. Right? There's Kate Daniels, and there's the Edge Chronicles, and there's the Innkeeper stuff. And it is so tight, man. She, they come in, and in the first chapter, you know about the magic, you know about the houses, you know about the the rankings, the prime, and the the and so forth, and you know. Um, you know that Nevada is hiding her her power, but you don't know how 
crazy it is. I mean, if you're really, mm-hmm. really analytical when you're reading it, which I'm not because I'm into the story, but on the third time I'm thinking about these things, right? And and if you really think about it, it's not going to be a story about somebody with a minor power, right? <laughs> Why would you? Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> So it shouldn't yes. be such a surprise when you find out how deep her power goes, but it, it kind of is. It's like this revelation that unfolds, and it's like, wow, I love that. But you know what, though? The foreshadowing is there. Like, on the second time around, I'm like, that very first time where she, like, lost her shit and told, you know, like, forced him to answer, yeah. did you send someone here uh-huh. to kill my grandmother? Da, 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 da. And he looks at her like, how'd you do that? And she's like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, my God, the irony of what's happening. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, lots of good foreshadowing as far as that's concerned. Agreed. I always chalk that up to the thing she had just implanted in her arm, like the first time I read it. Because um, mm-hmm. she had just implanted the thing. Shocker. I can't remember. Shocker. Yeah, that. She she just implanted that. So I always kind of assumed that that was kind of amping her power in that moment. But, you know, again, rereading it, knowing that, nope, the shocker just you know, shocks people. It doesn't do anything else. She has Mm -hmm. the power. She just doesn't want to acknowledge it. Yeah. Yeah. And I love like, even later in the book, when we finally, you know, we have the showdown and she has to learn really quickly. Like, you know, he's like, how do you explain something to somebody that doesn't even know what the thing is I'm trying to explain? But, you know, the active and passive magic, that whole explanation, I was like, wow, Uh that was explained so well. It was so crystal clear. Like, I just love Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, Alona Andrews and Gordon Andrews, they are phenomenal at world building and explaining things in a way where it's not like they're talking down to you, but they're explaining, you know, crystal clear. This is passive magic. This is active magic. This is what you do. This is how you do it. And and having Nevada not know anything about it makes it easier. Like that. That's that's a, a I don't know if I'd call it a plot device, but it's something that you do see where uh, trying to explain the world. There's somebody who knows everything about it. There's somebody who knows nothing about it, and they have to learn about it fast. So there's a mm-hmm. uh, there's a you can educate the reader at the same time you're educating one of the characters in a believable way. Yeah, and I I do prefer that over, you know, just pages and pages of like history. I mean, yeah. hands down, it was it was kind of piecemealed a little bit, and then at the end when she needed it, here's a you know kind of like a dump of information, but it fit because of the situation. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. because there's so much action in these books, it's it's such a you can almost these would fit easily into a thriller category like a spy novel or a, a Tom Clancy kind of. If you like Tom Clancy's pacing, these are right up there with all the action. It's just that there's magic involved, right? It's, so <laughs> And romance, but it's like low key romance. So at least at first, anyway. And I think I also this is back to what I really enjoy about romance and paranormal together. Where you know I hate the the tri- threesome thing. I hate when there's a choice. <laughs> I really appreciate and love when there's a couple that you know are supposed to be together, but they have so many trials to get through mm-hmm. uh-huh. that it makes it the payoff worth it, but it's not another person. i like this yeah. way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And we, we should say that the, the romance really spans the trilogy in this case. So you're not going to get a totally resolved romance in this book, no. um, but the connection is intense and you, you know where it's going and it's, it's satisfying. So it is satisfying mm-hmm. because that's another thing that we, if you've listened to us in the past or you've heard me complain about <laughs> Insta Love and bitch about, oh, y'all jumped in the bed on page two. I can't stand it. <laughs> but that's not the case here. And I love how it's like a slow, un, you know, I guess a slow delivery yeah. and realization of what's going on. Well, and I like that it's not totally open ended like it would, like it was in Kate Daniels. I mean, her and Curran got together pretty quickly but but with the open-ended series you never knew exactly what was going to happen so i do kind of like the trilogy Mm -hmm. format where we get a good conclusion at the end of the three books um and 
and they're so popular that you know they they're writing more books in the world but not more books about Nevada and um and Rogan. So I I kind of love that that uh structure of the series. Yeah, and especially because it seems like series long series are on trend right now. Like everything is a long term yeah. series and commitment. And it's refreshing to know that you're going to get a beginning, a middle and yeah, an end. Absolutely. Yeah. I love, I, I really like that. And I've read some trilogies that really should have been one book, you know, that mm-hmm. they're, they're really one story in three parts. And that that's not what's going on here. This is a very complete story. It's just that the, mm-hmm. the romance takes another couple books to, um, to resolve. Nevada is a character I mean, I can see right now she's got a lot of growing to do. Yep. And she'll get there. I mean, it's clear from this right. book. Like she's very powerful, more than she ever yep. thought. And and there's a series arc too. There's a mystery that, that goes on across the three books. But as far as like this, this section and dealing with Adam Pierce and dealing with Kelly Waller and Gavin Waller, it's uh uh and and you know, the other part is um Nevada discovering like the active magic and how to use, use the shockers and how to deal with how to go toe to toe with primes. You know, I also really loved Nevada's family. Like her grandmother yeah. is hilarious. She's amazing. She's so you know, I started funny. this hashtag on Twitter. It doesn't have a huge uplift, but I call it, he smelled like three things, you know? Um, and I think it's super funny. It's a, it's, it's common in uh-huh. romance, but uh, in this one, we have grandma smelled like three things, right? It was <laughs> and, and not what you think it's gasoline <laughs> uh, motor oil and gunpowder and it just cracked me up <laughs> so, it's that grandma smell like no that's not a grandma smell mm-hmm. that's your grandma smell <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. well there's no magic it's, it's, your all, magical it's all grandma mundane smell. stuff but i mean her magic is in mechanics yeah and i love that there's some magic that's not like organically based you know that it kind of comes up in response to their environment. Like, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I just thought that like, that's unusual. Usually the magic is something arcane and and non-technical, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This old lady is building like, or rebuilding tanks and stuff. Like, Hey grandma, I need a really good gun on this one. Can you find me some extra power? (laughs) Thank you. That's right. We need to triple the armor on this one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love how I love how that's like the spoils of war too, right? They get into a battle and she's like, "Hey, grandma, there's a Humvee on uh, 87th Street, and it's all yours, you know, or whatever." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and grandma's eyes light up, and she goes running after it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that is priceless. Oh I mean, I'm telling you. <laughs> Even her mother. I liked her mother a lot um, as well. She had her protective moment moments of Nevada. The- Penelope mm-hmm. is an amazing character, and um, you know, having just read the first book and the second trilogy, um, there's hints that she's going to get, and I think there were hints in this trilogy as well that she's going to make a connection. And I would love to see maybe a novella just about her sort of finding happiness after her husband's passed away. Because um, I, I, what struck me, another thing that struck me in the beginning of this book is how sad everybody in the family was, how much sadness there was from their dad's passing and how much everybody has struggled with it. And I think that gets lost in the adventure when you're reading through it, trying to find out what's going to happen next. But um, <laughs> but there's, you know, on a, on a reread, you can sort of feel some of the stuff that's layered in there. And, and that really struck me that, you know, Penelope was very still mourning the, the passing of, their, of uh, her husband and... Uh, you know, they're all struggling a little bit with trying to make the business work and living in a warehouse and uh, they're a little bit on the edge, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of sad things around, you know, her father's death and obviously Nevada herself feels a lot of guilt about something that's really not in her control. But as a kid, she felt guilty about, making a choice not to share the info information mm. she knew. Um, yeah. And I mean, even when it comes to her cousins, you know, Byrne and the Leon. other cousin, Leon, you know, their, their mother. Yeah. Leon, their mother is like a hot mess. And they go into that a little bit. Yeah. That- Do we ever find out what happened to her? 
I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember it coming up too much, so... Um. Well, no, there was something about, like, her mother, um, when they were talking about, oh, my mom says I only get, yeah. um, I'm yeah, only he, here because, you know, she got drunk yeah. and such and such and such, or something. Mom. It was that section where they were talking about She was that. too drunk to remember a condom, and then yeah. her, his dad was going to call the cops, and she didn't want to go back to jail, so she had to distract him somehow. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that doesn't, so I, I'm hopeful that we'll get a burn trilogy, you know, a burn for me, burn. I don't know. <laughs> something. Uh, I'm loving Catalina's <laughs> story. So that's, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm, I'm hoping that all of the family members will get a trilogy. That would be nice. Honestly, I would really, I wouldn't mind reading one off of all of them. I would love a story about Burn. Yes. I just love mm-hmm. him so much. Yeah. And I, I think like he him. grows through the series too. That's one of the other things I really love about Alona Andrews and their characters is that they all, you know, all the characters, the secondary characters and everybody grows. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, it, I feel like, you know, I don't know if this is true, but I feel like Andrews, the team knows, like they have this plotted out for the next 10 years. Like they know exactly why they've made had Burn say this or that, and they know exactly what's going on with Leon, and they know exactly what's going on with these tiny minor characters that show up for a minute in a novella, and then they turn into like a major character in the next book. So I just uh, I, I admire mm-hmm. that so much, and sometimes it takes a couple of books before you you find out you know why it was like this or that. You know, I do wonder, like, when you do this type of series, you know, when it's Mm -hmm. sets of trilogies, like, how far in advance did they plot this thing? Did they plot, like, the entire thing? And now they're, you know, writing. I would love to know what they had to say about how they built this. We'll have to ask Because if it was coincidental... It's a miracle. <laughs> I, know. I, I really think that at least in this book, when they wrote this book, they were expecting to only do a trilogy. So I think they put in all the detail about the cousins and stuff to, and the sisters to build up the stakes for the, um, um, for why Nevada does what she does. And, you know, what, if Houston becomes, uh, you know, um, is leveled, you know, then all, all of this family is going to go down. So I think, I think initially it probably was like the more real these people feel to the reader, the more we feel the stakes that Nevada feels when everybody's in danger. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then they just turn it into so much. It's so awesome. I just love it. Yeah. It's very opposite from Kate Daniels and that series because she's always alone and she's always just, you know, fighting for herself and, Yes, she picks up people along the way, but her whole thing was that she had no family, she had nobody, she had to fight and be on her own. Whereas here in this trilogy, it's all about the family, and it's all about protecting your family and Nevada's family and, you know, the mother, the grandmother, the sisters, the cousin. There's so many people, and it's a huge network. And I just love how they can create these different dynamics and they all feel so original and real. And it's just like, you know, yes, I know it's the same author, but I almost wouldn't know if I didn't have their name on the top because it's so different. And I love authors who can do that, who don't rehash the same character, the same, you know, dynamics with the families over and over and over again. I'm glad you mentioned like that, inherent like family protection because it even comes out like in this book where you know rogan is trying to find that trigger yep. for nevada mm-hmm. he's like well it's not anger it's not fear it's your protectiveness you feel protective over your family so she saw her brother her, her cousin in trouble yep. and she just went off like oh yep. my god <laughs> this is what it yeah, is yeah that was that was kind of horrifying that was a real glimpse into um into Rogan's character too, you know, that, that he's willing to endanger someone to, to get what he needs, you know, and I don't say what he needs, but what, what the situation calls for, Mm -hmm. right. For the greater good. So it's a very military kind of, um, trade-off. Does that make sense? Yes. But also said he volunteered to do it. 
Yeah, but that wasn't revealed Rogan until later. Awful, but Byrne also yeah. did volunteer and agree and knew what he was doing. It wasn't like he was just plucked out and thrown True. onto the street. True. True. It still right. feels like it's a it's it's a it really shows Rogan's coldness. I- oh yeah, no, he's he's almost psychopathic, like Nevada says. See, I don't know if I would say psychopathic, but I feel like I'm okay with that because like, even when we talk about zombie apocalypses and stuff, you've got to have one person that's willing to do the dirty yeah. work to get the job done. And that's yeah. him. Yeah. Opposite oh, yeah. of Nevada. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think, I don't think, I would say sociopath, um, at least in the beginning, you know, because his powers are, are so isolating, you know, um, he's had to sort of, Mm -hmm. um, create this, this distance between himself and humanity really, because nobody can match him until, until now. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is always the best. I don't know. It's one of the plot devices I love in paranormal. I was just, I've just been rereading, um, um, one of the books in the, Black Dagger Brotherhood, and, and and it's it's the same thing there, and it's the same thing in um, uh, Natalie or, or Nalini Singh's um, uh, Side Changeling. This so R- Rogan reminds me of Krychek a lot. So, uh, at least in terms of their magical powers. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, I can see yeah. that for sure. Yeah, I haven't read that, but to have a character that's so powerful that no one can beat him, like yeah. he always wins. It's yep. like you've got he's he's developed, you know, a cockiness and like you can't touch me no matter what I do sense about things. So of course that's gonna make you weird, weird. <laughs> act differently. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, and you know, everybody yeah. always wants something from him. So um People rarely, and everybody's terrified of him. So to find someone that's not scared of him, I think, is a is a key. And when I say him, I mean any of these three characters that I'm talking about, Vicious or Krychek or, or Rogan. That, that's one of the key things that draws them to the heroine in the story. Like she's not terrified mm-hmm. of me. She's smart. She's not dumb. She knows what I can do. Um, but she's still going to poke me in the chest and yell at me, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Because she knows I'm not mm-hmm. going to hurt her. Because she knows that she sees that in me. She sees that um, that n- tiny nugget of honor or whatever. <laughs> I don't. It, like in Nevada's case, I don't know if it was that she just knew he wouldn't hurt her. I just felt like she knew she didn't want to succumb to somebody who would kidnap yeah. her and yeah, chain her I, to the floor. I, I, so yeah, it's like I'm going to go up against you. I don't care what comes out yeah. your mouth. You did this. Hello, yeah. <laughs> he's reminding him. Like, yeah, I, I agree. But you know, um, just just like in, I mean, she's kidnapped. Jane got kidnapped, um, and they're both really, really angry, and yet they have the, these um, these feelings of attraction. So, um, trying to fight that off, I like, I, I, I've, I don't know. It, it when it's done well, it's so good. It's been done very poorly many times, but but when it's done well, it's mm-hmm. really good. And I think it's that level of um, self knowledge that the character has, where they're like, okay, this is this is sex and this is anger, and they're not the same, but they're kind of related. And you know, I'm I'm attracted, but I don't care. I'm so angry with him because he's a bad person. Look what he did. Um, but then they start seeing the motivation and they start understanding what's underneath and, um, and they start coming around a little bit. So, um, which I'm torn on, like (laughs) in one way, I understand exactly what you're saying when it's done well and it makes sense. And the, you know, the woman doesn't seem like she's just going, falling for anything. Right. Yeah. It it feels okay. Right. But then there's the opposite there's the opposite of that when it's done poorly and it's like you're just gonna run yeah. off with your kidnapper are you dumb yeah so yep. <laughs> yeah 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 that that um redemption thing really has to be done right and the i don't know i just when it's done right i love it um but but when you try to describe it mm-hmm. to somebody they're like um so he did what and then now they're together um <laughs> i i why <laughs> you know that yeah I mean, because honestly, in the in the context of this it book, was. that was a bad situation. He chained her down, and he, she had to like fight him yep. out uh-huh. of her mind. Basically, More that was not her good. power. 
Yeah, that was a yeah. really uh, interesting th- scene. And I think maybe that's why it takes them three books instead of one to end up together. Um, is mm-hmm. because he's, yeah. Um, I don't know, because there's so much conflict there and there's so much going on besides attraction. You know, he does have to grow and change and you see the seeds of it now. Like, you know, the guy who kidnapped her is not the same guy who walks into the... Um, garage at the end and says you know i get kind of is though i mean he kind of is is. but he is but he isn't because i was just gonna say that at the end he's like okay you've had a week with your family let's go and she's like excuse me (laughs) yeah like what like in his brain he's like okay i gave you what you wanted i gave you that week and she's like no it's the answer is still no and he walks away he doesn't kidnap her right then i was a little worried he might but he did threaten her he said oh Okay, we'll see how this goes. Once I, you'll want me at the end of this, and we'll revisit this conversation. So yeah, it's like, so you know. it's the seeds okay, of cocky growth. <laughs> he's he's starting to change and get better, and it takes him two books to fully, you know, become the man who she can be. Like, okay, yes, now we can go off and travel the world together because you've changed. And again, that stems from his whole life and, you know, isolating himself from everybody and his potentially psychopathic, sociopathic, emotionless, whatever. Yep. So what do you you guys, I think we could do a compare and contrast with Adam and Rogan, right? And they're both these hugely powerful primes that Nevada can't really fight on her own. Um, And they're both kind of sociopaths. <laughs> They're both uh, <laughs> have uncertain motives. Um, so what makes, what makes, what makes it okay with Rogan and it's so not okay with Adam? Well, my first initial response is Rogan's a man and Adam's a boy. Like that was yeah, just Adam's in, his, Adam's in his 20s. He still acts like a teenager. True. He still has that small boy mentality of just, give it to me. I can do what I want. I can do whatever I want. Like again, teenage boy. Whereas Rogan, he went into the military. He went to war. He's killed people, but he doesn't flaunt it the way that Adam does. Cause Adam's like, Oh look, these are my badges of honor. Or as Rogan is like, this is shit I had to do because this is my magic. And I had to protect the rest of the country. Yeah. So he seems I, more actually, mature. I don't think they're that different. I just think out how they like Casey, kind of like what you're saying, they project it differently, but at the root, they're kind of similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, for example, I think of how even Rogan goes about finding his people, and Nevada kind of says this to him like, yeah, you seem like you're protecting your, your people, but really what it is is you want to make sure you have your thumb on everybody and they won't betray you. So, you know, he does something nice, mm-hmm. but it's like nice calculated. nasty. I have a yeah. point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's calculated. Just like Adam is, but Adam is just doesn't, he hasn't grown enough to do the same thing without all of the theatrics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's very nice and alluring and draws people in because they want to be part of his posse or whatever but he's cruel to them in a way that Rogan hides that cruelty. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I don't know yeah. Oh, yeah. if Rogan is cruel to, I, I was thinking we were talking about um, Kate Daniels um, collected family. I think Rogan has a similar thing. He's collected people along the way. And the difference is that Rogan would die for his people, you know? So I don't know that I agree that it's completely. Well, okay. Hold. You feel that right no. now in this no. part of the no. story, we, book one. <laughs> we're talking about okay. book one. We're talking right. about book All one right. here. All right, retract. Don't retract jump ahead. So, <laughs> that's true. I'll, I'll give you that. So it does seem like, the, but he he's he knows how to give something in, in return for what he gets, and Adam does not. Adam is just mm-hmm. like what you get is the the uh, advantage of being near me because I, I am awesome and you want that. You, yeah. You want mm-hmm. a piece of this. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I, I just thought the way Kate reeled him yeah. in was amazing, you know, not, not Kate, Nevada, um, because, you know, she yeah. can't use force 
it's not really seduction. It's it's more like just I don't know a tease. Like I'm gonna get you interested in. Yeah, and it's so it's so it's so dangerous for her. Like oh my god, it's so dangerous. Like she tells him no, but if she like pisses him off, he's gonna torch everybody she loves. You know, it's like so she has to be like this kind of Mm -hmm. uh, this dance and. I, I find it so believable um, in the way it's written. Um, I, I just, I, you know, I don't think I've read any book where the the underdog wins like this. Because when it came to Adam, she had to give him just enough interest mm-hmm. to make him think that he had a chance. Right. But not right. really do anything with mm-hmm. him. <laughs> like, even there's that one scene where Rogan's like, well, why does he, why is he, you know, all fascinated with you? What did you do? And she's like, excuse me? I didn't do anything. But what do you think? Uh-huh. You know, like. The same reason you're fascinated with me, dude. Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, it's a game. And it's a balancing act. And she did pull it off. One of the things I love mm-hmm. about this series, and I want to say it's probably similar. It's similar for The Innkeeper, and it was similar, and probably for Kate Daniels, too. But. I have the Casey talks about her her editor brain that kicks on and kicks off. I have I have this engineering brain, right? Oh, yeah. And in the very first chapter, um, Nevada is presented with this unsolvable problem, right? We need you to bring this guy in. You can't kill him. You got to be. You got to do it before the cops do. And uh, and here's all the ways that you're completely not equipped to do it. And by the way, I don't expect you to succeed. So there's this like basically unsolvable problem. And so the engineering brain goes, okay, what do we do now? What do we, how do we get around this piece? How do we get around that piece? If we can't, if we can't do it this way, what are the other ways we could do it? If we can't bring him in by force, we can't, we can't uh, capture him. We can't, uh, um, so he's going to have to come willingly. We'll have to talk him into that. How do we do that? What does he like? What does he hate? You know, what, what's going to make him interested? I just, I feel like, um, a lot of these books have that kind of a uh, um, problem-solving aspect to them that that really uh, draws me in personally. Oh yeah, and it really again from the editor brain it hooks the readers. It's this it's this unsolvable problem, and as a reader, you're mm-hmm. like, well, "What the fuck would I do? I have yeah. no idea. How is she going to do it? She has some magic, but it's not enough to really do anything." Because at this point, she doesn't yeah. believe she can actually do it. And so you're pulled in to this suicide mission and you see why she does what she does. It's because her family. It's because she doesn't feel like she has any choice. It's do this and save her family and, you know, they'll get a million dollars from her death and buy the company back for a yep. dollar and they'll be fine. Yep. Yeah. And that is a par- another part of Nevada that I think we all really enjoy. Not only is she brave, she's intelligent. Yes. She's yes. very intelligent. The, and the, the truth telling ability helps with that, right? She sees right through the bullshit no matter what. Yeah. I would love that. I mean, like the way she's able to just casually talk and it's a passive thing mm-hmm. she's doing. And she's just like, lie, lie. Truth, <laughs> lie. Just lie. How interesting. <laughs> like, you know, when she talks to Cornelia is like, oh, he's not lying. Oh, <laughs> hmm. this is interesting. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, because think about all the things that you might change in your own day to day life if you knew someone was lying to you or not. And oh, I yeah. think right at the beginning, you know, it doesn't come out till later. It doesn't come out explicitly till later when she says, you know, I, I never tell a lie when I can tell the truth. I just stopped doing that. I don't remember the rationale for it, but, but it comes out and she tells somebody this and, but right at the beginning where she, she's coming home to the family and she's all beat up from her, um, um, bout with the, uh, cheating husband and, um, and, uh, you know, her mom says, says what happened to you and 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 she says well i've already been checked out by the paramedics and what did they tell you to do they said i should go to the hospital and did you do it no <laughs> you know she doesn't it doesn't occur to her to, to like fib a little bit they said i was fine she won't do that uh even when it would make life easier for her and, mm-hmm. and not necessarily change the outcome that much you know so i think i think there's a little like how many of us yeah. would have just said they said i was fine <laughs> you know in that same position like like you're gonna take the, you're gonna tell your mom the truth no matter what. So, I think I think you're right, 
Casey, it just changes the dynamics so much. The, you know, the everybody lies thing. It's true. It's, we all tell little yeah. fibs to make life easier for the people around us and, and for ourselves, you know. Yeah. You know, that's why, I mean, I yeah. always say someone that says they never lie is a liar because oh, you yeah. do, even if it's like something teeny or something to save someone else's feelings. <laughs> oh yeah. How those you, shoes how are you, cute. Lie. How are you doing? I'm fine. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm fine. saying? I'm so stressed out and I got my back lie. hurts and right. I got all these yeah. money issues in my back of my head and I'm not fine, but you know, for the purposes of this conversation, right. I'm fine. Yeah. Everybody yeah. lies. Everybody. You know, mm-hmm. I think, I think society would be a scary place if we, if we didn't or couldn't. Yeah. Think about like, um, do you guys ever watch the good doctor? No. Well, it's about a doctor who has like, um, Oh, I can't even think of it right now, but he has like a slight disability where it's like anything that comes out of his mouth, it just shoots out of his mouth. He can, he doesn't know how to temper things for delivery and, uh, things like that. And if we all were like very, open with the truth i think we'd all be yeah, like be very society shocked uh-huh. <laughs> it would take us a while to acclimate to that kind of society where you just say really what's on your mind yeah. you don't soften it or cushion it or lie about it you just <laughs> say whatever yeah, it'd be a rough go of it for partly a, a matter of what you're used to i suppose you know i think if if the whole world were like that then it wouldn't it, it but transitioning from the way we are to to that way would be weird Right. So we've kind of talked about Mad Rogan and his character, but we haven't said how we really feel about him. Like, do you want to run away to wherever in the world with him, or do you want to run away from him? At this point in time, I agree with Nevada. Run away. I mean... (laughs) At this point in the game, it's like he's that guy. He's like the bad boy, right? He's sexy. Mm-hmm. Like, she knows what he can do with his mind now, yep. right? She's mm-hmm. like, oh, shit, that could be really dangerous. Um, and I could become addicted. So I need to just stay away. I agree. Right he's so her. powerful. And she doesn't know the extent of her powers, really. And other, other than what he's told her, right? So in that way, she's still kind of beholden to him. Um Yeah or what he's helped her figure out. So there's the, there's that attraction, which is hard to, which is not rational, right? I don't know if that happens in romance a lot. It's happened to me. I don't know if it happens to everybody where you're like, I don't see any reason why I should be like this guy, but I kind of do. And then they just amplify that a ton in in this kind Uh of fiction. Right. So, um, you know, I think she feels like he's just too dangerous. She's very used to denying herself for the better good of her family and and for and to, she's, she's used to being smart about things right this what's the smart thing to do what's the smart the smart thing is to get as far away yeah. from this guy as possible because because look at him <laughs> he's he's scary dangerous he has no concept <laughs> of my having agency you know he has no concept of uh, he, he believes he's right all the time how many of us know guys like that but in this case it's just amp- a million times right um, uh-huh. he's never wrong he's he's um and if anybody disagrees with him he just kind of rolls over him and not necessarily violently but with the other resources yeah. he has available he just ignores their their objections and that's that's not cool that's i think true. there's some i think there's some um a theme here about consent that's really important throughout this book it's not very explicit but it's kind of underlies all Mm of um uh, rogan and nevada's interactions throughout the three books yeah yeah. like even okay so i have two comments to that nicola so yes there was this one scene where you know he's like oh can i show you and she's like yeah you can touch me once and he goes all through that. And then she gets mad. And he's like, I don't understand. You liked it. She's like, yeah. so what? I told you one time and you did not listen, basically. Yeah. So there's that. And then also, so I like how Nevada refers to him as being a dragon. I feel like that mm-hmm. is very true. Dragons are beautiful. They're majestic. You're awed by them. You know, we all want to be Khaleesi with dragons. <laughs> but guess what? That thing will burn you and kill you. Yeah. <laughs> But what a way to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she's got to tame the dragon before yeah. she can ride it. 
<laughs> Literally and figuratively. Yeah. Sorry, kids. <laughs> hey, kids don't listen to this show. Just check my uh, demographics. <laughs> what do you think, Casey? The same as both of you. I think, like, yes, as much as I want to run away and ride him, um, he needs more work he needs to be tamed more than just like okay i said no but now i'm saying yes and he gets what he wants so if it was me not nevada i'd still be like yeah no wait we gotta work on all of this we gotta work on you yeah i would have yeah i, I don't know if she I'd even feels like she to- has to work on him at this point i think she feels like this is too scary like there's this is um you know like skydiving or something like it would be beautiful and wonderful. Mm-hmm. And at the end I might be a pancake. I'm, I'm not, I'm not okay with those risks with, with that risk odds, you know? Yeah. That's her. If it was me, I'd be like, I want to work on it first. <laughs> let's, let's talk things through okay. first. Let's Casey, get on the we same should page. talk about your choice, your, your uh, approach to dealing with men. <laughs> oh, I, I know. Can't fix them. Don't try to- I know. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. That's a podcast. That's a different podcast, but but uh, as a therapy yeah, session, Let's yeah, not. relationships are not fixer uppers. Moving on. <laughs> no. no, no. I mean, and honestly, I feel like Nevada kind of understands and accepts you. You're not right. going to change him. Mm-hmm. You're not. He is yep. what he is. He's the dragon. Yeah, dragons do what dragons do. But if the dragon were to change, it would be because yes. he wanted to. Yes, agreed. And I think, um, I think. Andrews does an amazing job of that. And I think that having all three books to realize that arc is, is really important for how extreme it's set up in the beginning. Yeah. I think also something I've really liked about this story, and even I think all of them do the same thing. It's just the amount of humor along with action and suspense and romance. It's like balanced so well. Like I've laughed out loud with some of the, shenanigans and some of the comments they flung at each other i'm like oh my god like and for me to just laugh out loud that takes a lot i, I agree feel like i agree i mean humor is always the subjective but i think you know if you've read andrews before um you kind of know what you're in for um nevada's not quite as dark of a character as Kate Daniels. Um, she's, she's definitely got a lot on her mind and got a lot on her shoulders, but she's, um, she's not, you know, raised by psychopaths, you know? <laughs> so, um, mm-hmm. um, I just, I really enjoy all the dynamics between the family, um, and, um, Kate's person, or, gosh, sorry, keep doing that. Nevada's personality, and I think Nevada really carries this. Usually when I do my reviews, I'm like, well, I, I, I really love either the hero or the heroine. And does, I, I, some people will only read for a hero or only read for a heroine. And I think Nevada really mm-hmm. carries this. This she's, she's the definite star of the show. And um, it's her strategies mm-hmm. that win the day. And uh, she needs Rogan to, to bring in uh, Pierce, and he does, right? He's the, the, the way they defeat him in the end. But, um, you know, it's it's 98% Nevada's strategy and um, a little bit of Rogan yep. helping out and um, giving resources to the, to the plan. Yes. I mean, even she was the main person who brought out the information they needed mm-hmm. to bring this thing to a close mm-hmm. when they, you know, she used the circle yep. and she learned how to use her power in the circle to kind of yep. get the information out of that guy, mm-hmm. which actually at the end of that scene was like this little banter that I just loved. <laughs> it says, quote, so Rogan pulls her out of the circle and he says, speak to me. <laughs> she says, I hate you. He says, okay, <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. And he's not even trying to be funny. He's just like, all right. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, she's all right. It's fine. Let's go. <laughs> Shortly, right after that, they did something else that I really loved. Augustine was like, you can't, or he was telling Nevada that she couldn't go out with Rogan. He's like, you're a drained battery. You can't do anything. 
you need to stay here. And she was like, no, I'm going. And he's like, well, what can you do? And Rogan turned around. And he's like, she can shoot him in the head. <laughs> and I was like, he loves her for everything she does. Like, it's not yep. just her magic. He knows she can kill people. He knows she has a fantastic shot and he wants her yep. out there with him. And I was like, oh my God, yes. Yes, I love that. <laughs> Do you want right. to talk for a minute about Augustine or Augustine? I'm not sure how you say it. I, I was thinking Augustine in my head. Boy, at the Augustine. beginning, he was just yeah, I think it's, the most I evil. It. Like, I hated him more than I hated Pierce at the beginning. Oh, yeah. He's. I just think he's the typical prime, though. Like, he's looking out for his own self interest. He's not to a prime, help with though, right? Everyone else. Sorry. Is he a prime? I thought he was like a the next level, not a noble, but the other one. What Sorry. significant? Yeah. I thought he was like just below prime and working for the other primes, but not quite there no, himself. Th- I thought he was a prime for two reasons. One, like Nevada was talking about how perfect he looked and he's smart enough to know just to leave one imperfection. And then like at that point, I believe she was kind of talking about him being like of a high house or whatever. And then later, when uh-huh. Rogan calls him pancakes, yes. yeah, okay. So they were together in whatever training or schooling that was. So I think he's a. Well, prime I think he's too. a prime because okay. he's the head of the household, and you have to have primes to be a house. Yeah. Although I, I don't know. If, I don't know. But if- he worked for House Pierce, so I thought he was lesser because he's working. I think for this it's not as house. big of a. I mean, and and maybe it wasn't really clear at this point in the story that you have to be a prime to to be the head of a household, um, but the different houses have different levels of of influence and power. But I think to be a house, you still have to have a certain number of primes. Okay, right. You do, but yeah, that's that revealed later. It. Yeah, I think they keep his power a little bit on the on the down low, but I don't think it says explicitly what his level is. I assumed he was a prime. At least by the end okay. of the book, I was assuming that. By the t- when I, if I were to think about it, I don't know if I thought mm-hmm. about it that much at the beginning. But but yeah, I mean, you kind of think of illusionist as maybe not that it's not a combat power. You know, it's it's maybe not as um, it's. Nope, it says so right here on page 32. Augustine Montgomery yeah. was a prime. Yeah, all right. that's all right. <laughs> because you can still be a prime right. and not have a right. combative power. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, for, you know, looking ahead, I'm not going to say anything, but there's someone else in the, in the story yeah. that has a very yeah. strong power that's passive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we'll leave that there. <laughs> right along with us. We'll talk more about it later. Yeah, I kind of actually like that he got got a little bit in the end with the contract because mm-hmm. they're like under the gun to go get this thing figured out. And Rogue is like, oh, wait a minute. We have a she needs a change in her contract right fast before we run off and take care <laughs> of it. Negotiates everything. I love like, that. Like what? Uh-huh. And that he actually consents. Like I, I felt like during that scene, like he probably could have just said, no, you're still under contract and you'll take it and like it or we'll take everything. So that he that he conceded a little bit seemed a little surprising to me, I guess. I figured it was because Rogan was right there. No, I was talking yeah. about the very, very beginning when she when they first gave her the job and, and he and she negotiated for um the family being able to buy back the business and I guess that was the only thing she got out of him, but Well, at that point he didn't well, care because he could write it off as a business loss true. and get money back. Yeah. So it was nothing. And he did just concede that she was basically going to die on this mission and he knew it. Yeah. So he figured, I mean, it's not like they were worth a whole lot of money anyway. So he could easily just give the name back to them. Yeah. So I guess maybe that was the first sign that he had, I don't know. So he didn't have to, he could have just, it didn't, doesn't benefit him at all. Other than maybe making her slightly less antagonistic, which would, Mm-hmm. be good for him i guess but um i think over the course of the trilogy um even in this book like calling him pancakes really humanized him like it really like i i loved that i loved that rogan had kind of the drop on him and 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 mm-hmm. um and took him down a peg i guess um 
But I think eventually he becomes kind of an ally and he's always kind of looking out for number one. He's always maneuvering and angling and she knows that, but, but, um, but he's not a total bad guy by the end of this book, I think. And for sure by the end of the trilogy. Um, well, we're coming up on an hour, but before we get there, I do want to address some comments I had regarding the audio book. Okay. I think it's important, especially since I know some of the people participating in the read along um, also listen to the audio book. Uh, okay, so you guys know I love this book, mm-hmm. but the audiobook did not do it justice. And it's so rare, and I was so surprised that Harper Audio didn't get a better narrator. Really? Let me tell you, okay. this woman, um, Renee Rodman, I don't know how old she is, but she oh, sounds no. like the grandmother. <laughs> oh, no. The whole time. Like a 25 year old you know, Nevada should not sound like her. So it was throwing me off. No. Um, and not, not with the sexy times. Oh, no. Oh. I mean, like, sometimes she was able to soften her voice when she was acting, um, I guess, you know, saying, speaking for, like, mm-hmm. some of the kids, quote-unquote. But Nevada, she sometimes she sounded young, and then other times you could hear mouth noises and things from older people people if that makes sense oh no and i I don't want to talk bad but i promise you i was really let down by the narrator i'm like wow thank goodness this story is so good right Mm -hmm. because sometimes a narrator can elevate the story or bring it down and without the the source material being excellent it could ruin it but it didn't ruin it because the source (laughs) material was bomb right (laughs) That's good. But definitely, I would not, I hope this woman is not doing the next trilogy. <laughs> I, I swear. Well, that sucks. Yeah. That's all. I mean, I just had to put that out there. I know it's like probably the most negative thing I have to say about this book, but it is the truth. And anyone else that has listened to the audio book, I dare you to say otherwise. I double dare you. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't, I didn't listen to audio for this book, but I've started listening since, since this podcast started, I've really sort of gotten into nonfiction in audio books and it makes such a difference. Like the narrator in nonfiction, a lot of times they'll have the author narrate. And sometimes it's amazing because the author is, can be so passionate about what they're talking about. And other times it's such a huge mistake mm-hmm. because yeah. they're very academic. They're very pedantic. They, they do things that are not professional. Like they'll leave big gaps in between yeah. sentences. <laughs> like trying to listen no. to that. Oh, like no. I, I listened to one. I had to, I sped it up to like 21, 1.25 or, or more even. So then it was like, but he, he wasn't talking slow, slow, continuously slow. He would talk, he would talk for a little bit like this and then leave a big pause. Mm. But he was talking kind of fast in between. So, <laughs> so if you try- yeah, I also chucked that up to editing too. So whoever their editor was could have brought that together. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. That's a combo of the narrator and the editing. But yeah, the narrator is so important. And I was so shocked. I'm like, why would they pick her? Like, I don't understand. I'm confused by it. Okay. Um, but obviously, some people really enjoyed her narration because... Some people did. Some people really liked it, but I didn't. I like now, but in, in full disclosure, if I had heard this first without reading it on my own and developing my own voice for Nevada, maybe I wouldn't be hating on it so much. But I think I would because she sounds old. <laughs> or maybe maybe you wouldn't have liked the book as much. Maybe you'd be like, eh, it was okay. Yeah. Maybe. I, I really like how Audible gives you, when you do a review on Audible, it gives you the option of reviewing the book separately from the um, audio performance because they, they really are two, two different things. Yeah, for sure. And on Audible, I mean, they actually have some leading questions to help you review the audio, right? Yeah. So some of the questions are like, what makes the experience of listening most enjoyable? What did you like most about the narrator? And so you'll mm-hmm. see a rating of overall has a rating, performance has a rating, and story has a rating. Yep. So you'll see some that has story of five, performance one. Yep. yep. Yes. <laughs> that's that's the case here. Yes, that is the case here. <laughs> All right. So let's rate this thing. I think um, 
unless we have some other really important things we need to point out, we should probably proceed and rate it. There's so much. We could talk for another hour, but I think we could go ahead and rate it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Nicola, you first. I'm going to give this one a six. A six out of five? Yeah. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Will you let me do that? <laughs> Sure, why All not? Right, I, love it. <laughs> I, I give it the highest rating. Love it. Okay, Casey? I give it a five out of five stars because I also love it. It has everything. It has action. It has romance. It has humor. This is the kind of book that I want to give my clients to be like, read this and learn how to write this way. Like, Look at how they weave the info dumping in where it's not, you know, just three chapters of information, but they teach it to you in a way that makes sense. And I want to be like, and then look at the character development. It doesn't all have to happen in one book. It can happen in three books, but you have the seeds here. So yes, Mm -hmm. this book is perfect. I love everything about it. Five out of five stars. Okay. I too gave it a five out of five for the story. And I mean, honestly, me, I found this um, cover art really cheesy. So definitely don't oh, yeah. judge the book by its cover. Yeah. Because I don't know. The I don't insides know. is amazing. I don't know what it is about that model, but that is not Mad Rogan. Uh-uh. No. Um, not at all. So five on the story. And again, I hate to do it, but the audiobook performance is more like a one. Uh, so I definitely recommend that you pick the book up and you read it. Don't bother with the audio book. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you guys come back next month. Let's carry on in this read along in November and read White Hot. Join the Facebook group and we can talk about it there as well. And that's it for today. Do you guys have anything else? No. Nope. Happy nope. reading, everybody. Until next time, take care and happy reading. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcast and leave a positive five star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading.